Same way you might think about a stroke or you might think about post-concussion syndrome. We can also think about that in terms of neurodivergence or childhood developmental disorders, where that change in the integration from the brain is going to affect all things downstream of that, including autonomic systems and even including... Some people say there's a correlation between hypermobility syndromes and dysautonomia with neurodivergence. What do you think about this? So neurodivergence in terms of the kind of thinking about people that are on the spectrum um, are going... So think about it simply. We started the day talking about, as we, as we kind of moved toward the end, we started the day talking about people that had ischemia at birth, they get cerebral palsy, and then later on they develop stroke, which are, is also another form of blood loss to the brain, and they both end up in these scenarios where we affect outputs. What, we, what we're now calling neurodivergence, which has had other names in the past, we're talking about people that have changes in brain function, just to keep it simple. And that brain function is causing different outputs and inputs in that system. So it may make them more or less, more sensitive to certain things, it may make them overwhelm easier, it may make them less sensitive to where they don't respond as well or they're, they're hypo responsive. And then same thing on the other side, they might be hyper and might have for a given input, they might have too much output or for a given input, they might not have enough output, right? So that's like the classic description. So if that's true, then anything where we're looking at tone. So one of the things that we know from early childhood development is that when we see people or kids that have problems with brain development, they will tend to either have more spasticity in the musculature for central problems, or they might become hypotonic when we see problems in the posterior portion, the lower portion of the, the cerebellum. So that tone of the muscles is going to be um, kind of displaying what's happening in the brain. So you'll see that also in neurodivergence as they get older, where you might see people that like kind of have different postures or tightness in their muscles, or they walk on their toes, or we might see them be really floppy where they don't have a lot of muscle tone. And in those cases, we're more likely to see them where they're going to have mobility challenges because their ability to have proprioception of the joints is impaired, which means you're going to have more mobility than if those joints were tightly controlled. So they're not, again, we use the road analogy. If you have a high level of input and tuning, you're going to keep it between the lines really tight. So we're able to control it a lot more with the musculature. If that's not getting in there, then we may fall off into the ditch a lot easier, which means we're going to see more on the hypermobility side. So that's one part of it is the, you're looking at the relationship of hypotonia and neurodivergence, which is a strong overlap. We talked a ton about how much the outputs of your brain are going to control the integrity of the autonomic outputs, the autonomic system. So if I can, again, same thing, hyper or hypo, does it, it can go both ways. If I'm not sensitive enough to my environment, I may see that I don't respond as well. So the same way we might see someone, someone with neurodivergence might have orthostatic hypotension, where their blood pressure is really low, they're passing out, that's super common. We also can see where it runs the other way, where... Not only do we see POTS, but we might see uh, inappropriate sinus tachycardia where the heart rate just screams along all the time and they just maintain that high heartbeat. They may not even notice that they have symptoms or problems with POTS, but they might just sustain a high heart rate. Whereas other people may notice that it is responsive to orthostatic problems and we may see in vestibular or visual problems with that. So the same way you might think about a stroke or you might think about post-concussion syndrome we can also think about that in terms of neurodivergence or childhood developmental disorders, where that change in the integration from the brain is going to affect all things downstream of that, including autonomic systems and even including what we think of as structural things in hypermobility that may actually be more relative to uh, muscle tone and hypotonicity. So it's a really good question, but it's a good, it's a good reminder of how these different neurological conditions, even though we get them in different ways, they affect different parts of the brain, but we can see that they have similar outputs in terms of what we see symptomatically. Originally diagnosed with uh, inappropriate sinus tachycardia, was having it during my active STAN test, and I think that influenced my POTS diagnosis. Is there a difference in the treatment? So one thing about inappropriate sinus tachycardia is it doesn't tend to come in waves. It tends to be relatively consistent. So there's a high probability that that is useful. 
Um, and we treat IST as like its own separate bucket amongst people that have POTS because it's telling you the resting rate is already high. So if you're just thinking about like the starting place of those two bodies, if they were like two different machines, I used to have this one, I used to have this car. First of all, I live in Michigan, it's cold where you got to go out in the morning, you crank up the car and I had this old, it's not old, it's beautiful, number one. It's 1995 Ford Explorer Sport, red, it's wonderful. I was 17, it was great. Um, anyway, you'd start it up though and it would rev really high. And so like you'd be sitting in it in the cold and it would just be cranking out and you hear the engine going, you'd be like, man, that doesn't sound like that's probably good. But eventually it would kind of kick in and then it would lower back down and idle at a lower speed, right? So if you think about that, if I'm having to just relax, but my engine is running faster, then we know that that's probably not ideal. That means our body is working harder to be able to do a resting amount of things than someone who their heart rate is normal at rest. So it just tells you that the resting state is slightly different than it would be in someone who's got a normal resting rate. Obviously, that's telling you something different about how your brain is processing, processing that signal or how that wiring diagram is working. So um, is it different in the treatment? Yeah. So you want to know, is that something that happens consistently? Does it happen periodically? Does it happen with anxiety? Does it happen with position? And then you can kind of start to tease that out. Why are people nauseated by movement and can't stand on the ground? Why might they feel a little bit stronger and sturdier on a vibration board? And then the secondary follow-up to that is, how does it help neuropathy? So what you can think about a vibration board is kind of like an amplifier of what helps you feel your feet. So the same way you can use a bullhorn or a microphone and be able to amplify your voice, using vibration is going to stimulate those little vibration receptors in your skin and in your muscles and in your bones in a way that is more than if it's just at rest. And if they do that, there's more signal that's coming to the brain. So if those nerves are like a little, you know, not running as hot, right? They're, they're not transmitting as well. There's a, you know, a, a significant percentage of the signal that doesn't get through, then by adding more signal that would normally feel like a lot of signal might be just enough to kind of pull you back up toward a baseline amount and have you feel a little more steady with what you're doing. And that can actually be a really useful like data point for people, especially if you have neuropathy, small fiber neuropathy, large fiber neuropathy that affects your feet. If you notice that, then that might be the little wedge in to think about how you may try to solve that problem too. So it kind of starts out as like um, being able to like give you a lift, give you a boost. So I have... Um, so we have a little pull-up contest at the Kaiser household amongst the children. And they all had the opportunity to earn a significant amount of money if they were able to do 10 pull-ups by the 4th of July. We've extended that. We did not reach 10 pull-ups. But the two older ones are coming along. I think we're at four and five pull-ups each. So they're coming. They're doing well. We practice them. And then, but the little one, she's... She's not pull up ready yet, but I give her a boost. So I give her a little bit of boost and help lift her up and then bring her back down. Right. And that helps. And what I'm trying to do is like give a little less boost every time. And you can think about that the same way when you're thinking about peripheral neuropathy. So I want to give those, those sensors a boost so I can get the signal to my brain and link the two back together. But then I want to see, hey, as I do that, and that connection kind of starts grooving a little bit, it gets a little stronger, can I give it a little less of a boost and a little less of a boost until it just operates on its own? My daughter's doing her own pull-up. Your feet are feeling their own, their own selves, and then you're able to overcome some of that neuropathy. So um, that is a model with which you can think about neuropathies writ large, whether that's something that's coming after an immune consequence these are our kind of our younger people, our Guillain-Barre type diagnoses. Or if that's from something that's more of a diabetic neuropathy or, or something that's affecting us as we're getting a little older and we're affecting those small fibers that way. So good question. It applies 
to both cohorts though. So it's really a, a really nice tool to use even in people where we see, you guys have seen me talk about this before, but people that have small fiber neuropathy or even um, neglect syndromes where we can start to improve the signals back up to the brain using peripheral nerves, which is pretty cool. And by letting those nerves be able to speak to the brain better, we can reorganize those maps of where to send blow or blow, <laughs> blood flow, um, which is pretty fun.